Coming up on DTNS, autonomous vehicles need to report more mishaps. Facebook is back to its cloning tricks, and the Microsoft Google truce is off. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, June 30th, 2021. In Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, Cleveland, oh, Ohio, shoot. I'm Rich Straffolino. <laughs> Sorry, in Salt Lake City, I'm Scott Johnson. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Listen, we're all very excited to be on the show today, <laughs> as you can tell. This is, Mainly this is, me. It's, it's a fine. Habit. It's fine. Scott, Scott is pumped uh, yeah, before I'm the ready, show. Man. We were talking about, listen, Scott has a bad back. Give him a, give him a break, everybody. <laughs> we are talking about that before the show. Um, also, commutes and how they can vary and suck, depending on how far you have to go. If you want the wider conversation on our expanded show, Good Day Internet, become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Slack released a new audio tool called Slack Huddles, which lets users have real-time audio conversations inside Slack with included real-time transcription. Slack is also working on a video feature to let users record and play back video, voice, and screen recordings natively in Slack, planning to offer it to paid teams in the coming months. The Google Play Store will require new apps to be published with the Android app bundle starting on August, starting in August of this year, replacing APKs as the standard publishing format. Google introduced Android app bundle at I.O. back in 2018. It uses 15 percent less space than APKs with faster install times. Shopify will reduce the commission it takes on its Shopify app store to 0% for developers that make less than $1 million on its platform as of August 1st, with developers charged 15% on marginal revenue over that $1 million mark. So $1 million and one, 15%. This will also apply to Shopify's theme store set to open to developers on July 15th, with each platform treated separately in terms of revenue. AT&T announced that all Android phones on its network will use Google's Android Messages app for both SMS and RCS services. So T-Mobile made that same deal with Google back in March, which leaves Verizon as the only U.S. carrier still to switch to Android Messages by default. AT&T will also support end-to-end -end encryption for RCS that Google's rolling out to all customers this year. Compared to SMS, RCS, which stands for Rich Communication Services, also has things like no character limits, can send larger files, can show typing indicators, Indicators, offers better group chats and Wi-Fi support. And according to documents obtained by Bloomberg, Amazon filed a request with the Federal uh, with Federal Trade Commission to recuse Commissioner Chair Lena Khan from handling antitrust enforcement decisions involving the company because she has a history of criticizing Amazon as a threat to competition. Amazon says Khan's previous statements convey to any reasonable observer the clear impression that she has already made up her mind about many material facts relevant to Amazon's antitrust culpability, as well as about the ultimate issue of culpability itself. The FTC is currently reviewing Amazon's proposed $8.45 billion acquisition of movie studio MGM. I love that. Big Tech says, hey, that person doesn't like us. She should be removed. <laughs> All right, let's talk a little bit more about anything that might be of interest to a Nest owner. Google confirmed it will provide critical bug fixes and patches for Nest devices for a minimum of five years after a product launches, with 9to5 Google noting that current Nest devices, like the Nest Cam Indoor, are still maintained after six years. So, you know, five years in minimum here. The company also said that every Nest product released since 2019 has been validated using third-party security standards with validation results published for review. So yesterday you guys had a whole story about those Western digital drives and um, the, uh, the sort of going out of... Uh, support and then them becoming part of a botnet and then everybody's stuff getting erased and all the controversy around that. And I couldn't help from that coverage to just think about how many items are in my home or in your home or anyone's home that are supposed to be Internet of Things devices that are supposedly supposed to be various levels of secure, uh, lots of different companies. I've got webcams from one company, webcams from another company. And it occurs to me that uh, eventually we're going to run into this this kind of large scale problem about patches, fixes, out of life, uh, dropping support, no longer supported sort of world where we're just sitting on a, a maybe a bit of a time bomb or uh, I don't know, maybe you guys disagree with me, but it feels a little, a little uh, precarious at the moment. 
Well, we've already seen this in a lot more like white box IoT stuff, like baby monitors and stuff that's just kind of repackaged, uh, you know, standard system on a chip kind of stuff and put out there where there was like no support at all. And then all of a sudden they show up on Shodan or something like that. So this is great that Google is is providing a, a, a minimum clear amount of support. Now, this isn't from the point of sale. This is from the point of release. So, you know, if you're buying something later in its life cycle, but just as important as this, I think, is kind of what the what what is the process of when you hit that end of whatever the service, you know, whatever the support is going to be. Is it just going to be a pop up on your, you know, your Nest or, or your Amazon uh, device that says, hey, you're out of support, you know, please upgrade. I think a lot of the times for like phones and, and uh, maybe like streaming media players and stuff like that. A lot of times, like the functionality is no longer there that kind of, you know, encourages you to upgrade usually when those devices are out of service. But like that Western Digital uh, example, you know, Scott, people are still getting a lot of good use out of those devices or, or you know, at least had them on their networks with valuable data on them, presumably. Um, so, you know, it, when, when these are still functional devices, but they are out of support, the I think the issue becomes not just the years of support, but how do companies let people know, hey, this isn't getting bug fixes anymore. We've seen the UK kind of, uh, 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 they're considering a secure by design law that basically says, uh, uh, disclosing to consumers at the point of sale how much support they still have on these devices. That is not law that is just being proposed right now and it's been going back and forth for a couple of years so we'll see if that ever happens. But you know, it, it's the support is great but also what happens at the end to give consumers some kind of choice that doesn't feel like planned obsolescence either. Yeah, and part of, part of this is, <laughs> The problem, part of the problem is we go to Amazon and we go, what am I looking for? Well, I'm looking for some kind of doorbell camera thing. <laughs> do I get a ring or do I pay for this really inexpensive one from a brand I've never heard of? Well, maybe I'll do that. Not a lot of people are going, which one is going to offer the most secure and longest term <laughs> this? And they're going to make sure their servers are that and this and the other and all the data protection I need. No one's thinking about that any more than they used to think about it when they bought a regular doorbell. Um, so now we're just into a, a period of time where some of these commonplace household accessories slash, I don't know, appliances are asking for access in a way that we're maybe not even sure we're giving. And I feel like that's all just, ooh, I just, it feels like a fuse and I don't want to over, you know, overstate the danger, but all I know is I'm thinking a lot about the little things all over this house that I haven't really vetted uh, yeah. in a long time. So I mean, we'll I appreciate see. Google's transparency here. It's mm -hmm. like, here, here's what we're going to do. Minimum five years. Okay. You know, yes. From the release, not necessarily from the day that you buy it. But when you think of something like a nest product, right? Like I got a nest thermostat upstairs. That's the sort of thing that you don't buy thinking, well, you know, I'm going to upgrade pretty soon, but the company wants you to do that. <laughs> right. This whole end of life thing is because the company is like, in five years, there's going to be such a better thermostat. Why would you even be using that stupid old one anyway? But that is a weird way to think of it when you buy something that's, you know, quote, long term, whether it's a yeah. toaster or a or laptop. As increasingly it becomes infrastructure in your home, it's easier to think that's a part of like the doorbell. That's just part of my house. Right. That's not that's not like necessarily tech. I'm thinking I'm interacting with. That's where the danger, I think, comes in when these devices leave support. Well, let's move over to another place where there's a lot of danger, sometimes anyway, on our highways and byways. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration announced a change in reporting requirements for autonomous driving systems, requiring makers of level two to level five driving systems to report incidents within one day of learning of a crash, as well as submitting monthly reports on all incidents resulting in injury or any kind of property damage. Until now, driver's assistance systems, such as Tesla's autopilot, have fallen into a regulatory gray area where incidents don't require or receive further examination. Level two driving systems must now report crashes involving a death or injury, treated at a hospital, a vehicle towed away, or an airbag deployment, or even the involvement of a pedestrian or cyclist. Uh, the NHTSA can issue fines of $22,992 per day for noncompliance or up to 100 dollars million dollars um that, that's a that's a lot but um this is okay it's not that unrelated to the first article today that we talked about we 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 are starting to see as we get further down the road with autonomous vehicles the need for i don't just mean regulation and the government getting involved but the need for just some standards and rules and this just feels like more of that and i don't know how the car makers slash systems makers are feeling about this but yeah some some fines if you don't do it well, and I think, you know, the 
having level five autonomous, that's, you know, that's full autonomous, right? Like no driver, it's, it's doing its own thing, uh, saying, well, yeah, those, those, you know, incidents should be reported, right? Yeah. And the administration saying, yes, and so should, so should all of these levels of autonomy, because if you're talking about something like Tesla's autopilot, you know, great example where, uh, you know, there, there is, we're, we hear, well, unfortunately, all the time, we hear of incidents where it's like, well, what happened back there? You know, there's an autopilot feature. A driver is supposed to be totally aware, know what's up, can't be checked out, can't be watching a Netflix movie in their lap kind of a thing. But there are enough incidents that happen where the company certainly is like, hmm, okay, you know, did we mess up? Did they mess up? What's the deal? But this isn't always getting reported. And it's not as if the company is necessarily going to be at fault for every report. But I, I, I do think, I don't know, I mean, I, I definitely err on, on the side of uh, let's please p proceed very cautiously with all of this stuff, uh, even though people are bad drivers too, you know, but it's, you know, it's, let's, let's, uh, let's move to a solution that doesn't present its own set of problems and, you know, keep hitting pedestrians type of a thing. But uh, yeah, the fines of, the fines are steep. Um, I think that, you know, yeah, that uh, the administration is not messing around here saying you got to report this stuff to us. We want to know what's happening. You know, even if an airbag gets deployed, maybe nobody got hurt. Maybe nobody went to the hospital. Maybe the cops weren't called. But what happened and why? Especially when you have yeah, these sorts of systems on board. And I think this is a, a shift from allowing maybe some of these self-driving companies to view these kind of instances as almost like trade secrets where, you know, Waymo or, or Tesla will come out and say, we've driven so many thousand miles and we've had, you know, so many incidents per miles driven and stuff like that, but not, you know, giving us the broad strokes, but maybe not getting into the nitty gritty. And whenever these instances do kind of come up, uh, the idea that there's always this ambiguity, right? If it's like, oh, are we going to get the Tesla report on this? Is the NHTSA involved or other, you know, other federal agencies involved uh, when we will we'll get some clarity into this? And it leads, and honestly, it leads to a lot of sensationalized headlines at times where we don't know the full facts, but people are assuming, oh, this, you know, this car had autopilot, so this crash, it seemed inexplicable, must have involved the system or something along those lines. I also wonder if this is, uh, you know, the NHTSA and, and, and kind of other regulars kind of getting ahead of saying, okay, we need to build, if self-driving is going to be a thing, we also need to build a public trust around this, very similar to, air, to early air travel in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. where when there are these incidents, people need to you know, not see this first maybe in the media with a lot of unknowns being flown out there. We need to have facts on the ground as soon as possible so that we can inform the public of whether these systems are actually safe or not. Yeah, and Roger, Roger Pre-Show had a really good comment, basically said that uh, you know, more data is always better. Better data, more data. You can build better models, more reliable models based on that data. As long as everyone's a good actor in that data, um, yeah, like collect all the data you can. But boy, don't mess up and not report it or you're going to spend a lot of money. Yeah, I mean, it's going to take a while to get to 100 million, but that's a hefty fine for saying, <laughs> ah, sorry, I meant to send that report. <laughs> Didn't sign that TPS letter. Uh, well, speaking of collecting all the data, Facebook launched its own subscription newsletter service called Bulletin in closed beta. Users will be able to post content on the web, send it as an email, and, shocker, share it on Facebook. The company won't charge writers a fee for Bulletin at launch, and writers retain ownership of their work and, critically, subscriber lists. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell, Tan France, and Aaron Andrews are among the first writers signed up for uh, signed up for this in the beta period. This is obviously invite only right now. But uh, you know, Scott, are you going to be uh, when this opens up? You're going to be uh, first on there for a Facebook bulletin? Probably not. Um, I mean, I so everybody the, the the hot thing du jour at the moment for newsletters and or blog posts and subscription newsletters and that sort of thing is Substack, and this is being seen as a bit of a shot over that bow. Doesn't doesn't. Uh, doesn't surprise me, uh, given its quick growth, that others might get involved. And it's also the least surprising thing on this planet to hear that Facebook is uh, quickly building something out based on somebody else's success. This is what they do. Um, so not a shock at all. And also, arguably, the perfect platform for it if that's what you want to do. Personally, I don't think I would see too much of this as a big threat. Um, I mean, basically what they're saying is some big-name writers might join into this in the early goings. But it's really the long tail I care about. Where's the unique stuff, the niche stuff, the things I can't get anywhere else? Will they happen here? Will they happen at Substack? Will they happen at, uh, you know, some other feed service? 
uh, hard to say, but my my gut tells me there's room for more, and there's no reason why this is really all that big of a problem. Um, really, I think the reason people are most upset, and I said this in pre-show, I'll say it again, I think they're angry that they they found a niche in the market that is a little bit of a throwback. It's it's newsletters and blogging, basically, and it's kind of back, and they have control over whether they charge or don't charge for it, and it's a great community builder and all this stuff, and it kind of pulls away from the social media that we're all getting a little tired of in terms of its mass. And now here comes big social media saying, well, we're also going to do one of those. And I think that just puts people off. It's like if you're TikTok and along comes Reels, or if you're like Snapchat and along comes TikTok or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Everybody, nobody likes them fiddling around in their in their garden. And that's, I think that's all this is. But in the end, I think maybe that freak out will be a little wasted because people are, there's room, there's room for more of this in this this little niche space. I think it'll be fine. Yeah, this was this was Facebook launching bulletins. Uh, didn't actually make it into our show yesterday. Uh, it could have, but there were a lot of other news. But boy, between yesterday's show and today's show, did I read a lot of people just, I mean, it was I, it, just wailing. Like, can you believe that Facebook so blatantly ripped off Substack? It's just, have they no shame? And it's like, where have you people been? <laughs> no, they have no shame. I mean, yes, companies clone other company features all the time. I mean, look at Clubhouse, right? Like Clubhouse is a feature for everybody now. But Facebook in particular, and of course, Facebook-owned companies, uh, do this in, and have for years. Facebook cloning other services and trying to bury it into the Facebook experience doesn't always work. Uh, but I do think that something like Bulletin it, it makes more sense when you've got a big network that is Facebook based. It's kind of like why Twitter bought uh, Review, which is another Substack competitor earlier this year. I'm not totally sure where Twitter is going with that. I haven't heard much lately, but same idea. The company's saying, well, hold on. Some people hang out on Twitter, you know, to be able to reach their audience most effectively and be able to promote new stuff. And, you know, to have a newsletter component is something that we would want. Of course, Facebook would want this as well. I don't think, I mean, sure, if it looks and acts exactly like Substack, you, you know, give a little chuckle, but the folks that will go with Facebook as the basis for some sort of a newsletter offering that they're offering later, I think don't care about that. They just care about reaching folks. Where do you reach them? It will be interesting given the regulatory headwinds that we are seeing now, this appears to be kind of a separate service that operates well within Facebook, but unlike adding uh, a, you know, a clubhouse style audio chat room to messenger and adding rooms, which is building off an existing product, I will be, I, I, I wonder what the, the regulatory reaction will be to this for a wholly new product squarely aimed seemingly at you know, uh, you, Facebook would argue it's addressing a, a customer need. There's there's clearly a lot of interest in newsletters. You know, competitive concerns is this is Facebook being the 800 pound gorilla in the room. Right. Well, on on July 3rd, which is the Saturday, our science correspondent Dr. Nikki Ackermans will be releasing a limited series of podcasts called Seniors in Tech. In the series, Nikki will interview seniors examining how technology has impacted their lives. First episode is going to kick off with Allison Sheridan. You know Allison. She's on the show all the time here. And how her job as an engineer served as a gateway to technology and also to podcasting. So check your DTNS feed this Saturday, July 3rd. Kicking it off with Seniors in Tech. Bloomberg sources say that Microsoft and Google will not renew a non-aggression pact that's been in place since April of 2016, in which both companies agreed to a formal process, an internal formal process on both sides, for handling disputes that might otherwise go to regulators when it comes to things like web search, cloud computing, and artificial intelligence. Plus, they want to settle, they wanted to anyway, settle outstanding patent issues and keep competition limited to software innovation. Hey, we got to compete, but let's try to play nice anywhere we can before we get the regulators involved. Sounds like this ongoing truce has not been working that well as of late. The companies have publicly feuded over a proposal that would force Google to pay news publishers for content. We've talked about that on the show. Reportedly also disagree on how technology for selling search ads should work. Uh, speaking of search ads, some breakdown apparently started a couple of years ago when Microsoft complained that Google's Search Ads 360, 
that lets marketers manage advertising campaigns across multiple search engines, wasn't keeping up with new and updated features in Microsoft's own search engine Bing. Customers choosing Google spots because it was just easier. As a result, Microsoft saying, well, hold on a second. I mean, if we're an option and you're ignoring our cool new features, that doesn't seem like we're <laughs> not a truce. In 2020, Microsoft spoke with UK officials and regulators in some US states about this issue. So Microsoft was was not just complaining. There, were, there was some... Uh, there were some talks to be had. Microsoft also took public issue with Google's refusal to comply with the planned Australian law would have forced it to pay news outlets for content on its sites and apps feature, comparing Google's inflexibility to the ad tech dispute. Microsoft saying Google was hampering free and democratic discourse. At the time, we even talked about it on the show and said, Look at Microsoft. I mean, <laughs> why is Microsoft even needing to chime in really here? You know, when Microsoft isn't actually the company that's, you know, been been uh, so anyone's going after. For its part, Google has come after Microsoft, uh, specifically in the cybersecurity category, warning customers that using just one vendor for too many parts of the software stack. Microsoft in this case, puts them at greater risk of hacking. In a blog post, Google's SVP of Global Affairs, Kent Walker, wrote, quote, as we saw with SolarWinds and the Microsoft Exchange attacks, proprietary systems and restrictions in interoperability and data portability can amplify a network's vulnerability, helping attackers scale up their efforts. So, all right, so both Google and Microsoft uh, seem to be, you know, coming at the other uh, with a variety of, of nitpicks that that could have gone to, you know, a regulatory uh, decision long ago. The fact that the two companies said, let's, you know, let's kind of minimize this handshake, right? I mean, uh, under six years ago, both Google and Microsoft both had new CEOs. Both CEOs may have said a lot of the past squabbles, which I mean, are, are <laughs> many between Microsoft and Google in the past. Let's let's put some of this to bed, and you know the companies are going in a new direction. That all makes sense. Uh, doesn't sound like it. It's uh, going to be renewed, though. No, it sounds to me like uh, it's not sustainable. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't know how it is with companies this big and with companies with this many fingers and so many parts of the market, like both Microsoft and Google uh, and others, Apple, whatever. I don't know how any of these people. They might be able to have small victories of. We're working together on this one thing, and it's going to be cool for maps or whatever. But this idea that they would play nice in the very competitive search market, at least in the case of Bing, which is maybe the closest we've gotten to a mainstream competitor to Google since the 90s, um, you know, they, they, they. I think it's a, I think it's a really noble thing to want, but I don't know how they ever expected to have it. I don't think it's sustainable, and it's, it's a, a world where these two companies have to compete. So. You can only pretend so much, or maybe you can just do it in small cases and then not in others. It's a little like Apple and Intel or Samsung and Apple or anyone else who's supplying some product on the side, but otherwise compete in another area. Like you just have to get your wins when you can and not, not get too worked up when you can't. And I think that's these two. How are they going to do it? I, I do wonder though, Microsoft has so far somehow, despite being Microsoft, flown under the radar with all the tech regulation talk that we've been hearing for the most part. Uh, so the idea that they're they're you know opening the doors now to, hey, we're gonna go right to regulars. We're not gonna try and resolve this, you know, uh, with a with a handshake and a and a gentle CEO agreement or something like that. I, I think, Possibly, you know, Microsoft has done a very good job of staying ahead of issues. They're they're ahead on a lot of privacy, uh, uh, facial recognition, uh, just kind of the two just off the top of my head issues where they're they're out and ahead and trying to set the tone for regulation coming forward. Um, but with with all of the competition they now have when when it comes to cloud, when it comes to productivity suites, when we see compared to 2016 where Chrome OS is, you know, as, as a as a threat necessarily to Windows, they're outside of search, right, where they're the number one and number two uh, in the U.S. at least. Uh, there's a there's clearly a lot of places where hey we want to sell all these services to all these people and uh, it uh, it could get uh, pretty ugly pretty quickly. Yeah, it it's also not not that I'm super surprised that behind closed doors very powerful companies made some sort of a handshake agreement, perhaps signed some things. I mean I'm not really surprised about that, but at the same time I'm like, did how long did you think this was gonna last? I mean you know when it comes. You know, Microsoft saying, hey, Google, you're not giving Bing a fair shot. It's like, I mean, on the surface, that's almost laughable, right? Because it's 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 not on, on the know, surface, Sarah. I didn't well, mean played. it. That well, that was played. actually a, I, I'm a poet and I didn't know it. But uh, point Microsoft. <laughs> well done.
Yeah. Well, another point, Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft's X Cloud game streaming is now out of beta. We talked about it uh, in, on the show with the Quick Hit, I believe. Uh, it's available now all to Xbox Game Pass Ultimate subscribers uh, for all of your browser-based cloud game streaming needs. Scott, you've had a chance to play around with this. Uh, what have you thought uh, with the initial experience? Yeah, I went kind of nuts with it yesterday. So when the announcement happened, I was like, oh, this is nice. I don't even know if they had announced previously that it was going to happen, or at least they did, but it was very short notice. Um, it's still technically in beta. But uh, it was limited for a very long time to Android devices, and I, it may have been a couple other things with Windows. But like mainline Windows browser support, mainline support for Macs, for iOS, uh, other devices was not there yet, including their own Xbox Series S and X, and the one's not even ready yet. But the S and X uh, series of consoles didn't even have support for cloud gaming yet. That all changed yesterday, and I tried it on everything to get a taste for it, including an Xbox Series X where the game I was playing via the cloud was literally on the hard drive as well. <laughs> um, but I wanted to know, you know, how does this thing perform? And my my takeaway is probably not going to shock too many people, but basically anything that had a Wi-Fi connection worked better than I expected, but had some lag, uh, input lag, really. I wasn't having mm -hmm. video lag or artifacting or any other issues. In fact, I played a game, um, uh, Dirt 5, for example. Very frame rate intensive game. Uh, on a console, we'll run 60 to 120 frames on a TV, depending on what your TV is capable of in its native form. In cloud form, I was getting 60 frames per second. I wasn't getting artifacting, and I was playing this on an iPad Pro with an attached one of these, an Xbox One controller, uh, which I just happened to have an extra laying around, so I synced it to that, and it worked pretty much flawlessly. Again, the only noticeable thing I had was a little bit of controller lag, and I think that's the doubling up of controller lag because with wireless controllers, we already have one layer of Bluetooth lag. It's as good as it is these days. It's still not perfect. And then you tack that on top of we're streaming this game via the Internet. It's a little extra layer of input lag. Those two together create something I think a little more noticeable than you'd like. I think Stadia has got a better tech for handling that currently, uh, but we are in beta here, so who knows. Um, I tried this with the phone, tried it with an iPad, tried it with an Android tablet. Also, Windows uh, Chrome browser, Safari on a Mac, all of these performed nobly, no problems. Uh, wiring in your controller makes a massive difference, so you eliminate one of those layers of input lag potential. And on the Series X, which is the kind of the most interesting comparison, I think, um, it was kind of one one to one, a little bit of noticeable lag again because we're using wireless controllers, but it felt great and looked great and you'd have a hard time telling I wasn't playing the native hard drive version of that game. Um, so it does feel like in a mainstream way that this, the cloud gaming is maybe here finally, and it will be interesting to see what others do to make compelling arguments for their services. Right now you can do this for 15 bucks a month and you can play it on anything. And even if you don't own an Xbox, you can play it and all those game pass games are available. Um, I'll just say my first initial impressions with needed more time to test, pretty positive. Um, I came away from this thinking it was, a, it was a pretty cool implementation of this without removing all the other reasons you might go to these games on your PC or on your console. Now there's just like another third or fourth way to play it, and you're not paying any extra to do it, and that's kind of nice. Yeah, I was super skeptical when they, uh, I, I just the idea of playing like a high-end game stream through a browser, like especially on like an iPad or something like that, super skeptical. So glad to hear that they've ironed out some of those kinks. I know, you know, depending on the game, obviously the lag might not be as critical as something like Dirt 5 or something like that, but uh, it, it's, it, it's fascinating to see how quick this space has grown just even from, uh, you know, Stadia to xCloud and all the support they can have there. Yep. All right, well, Chris Christensen is finally taking some time for an international flight. Here's his latest tip for anyone doing the same. This is Chris Christensen from Amateur Traveler with another Tech and Travel Minute. I'm about to travel internationally again next week. I'm doing an international flight, and as I said before, in 2021, that's complicated. But there's a resource that will help, and it's from IATA, which is the International Air Transport Association, the same people who give airports those three-letter codes. If you go to IATA Travel Center, center spelled the UK way, C-E-N-T-R-E, dot -E com, then you can find information about every country in the world and what their restrictions are, whether you can get in with what kind of test and who can't get in, that will help you plan your travel. That's IATA travelcenter.com, and I'm Chris Christensen 
from Amateur Traveler. Oh, international travel. This is a great tip. Uh, I know a lot of people are <laughs> uh, maybe going international this year. So, yeah, definitely check it out because uh, restrictions vary quite a bit, depending on where you're going, where you're coming from. Uh, if you have any feedback for anything that we talk about, talked about on the show or might talk about on a future show or anything in between, feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com is where to send that email. We will be waiting. Also, shout out to patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Miss Music Teacher, James C. Smith, and Justin Zellers. Also, thanks to two brand new bosses, count them, two, Russell Skogstad and Corey Cousart, both just started backing us on Patreon. Thank you, Russell. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And a big thank you to Scott Johnson. Scott, uh, where can people find you if they are uh, so inclined? If they've, they've never heard of the Scott Johnson Media Empire, where can they find oh. more about it? Wow. Uh, Wikipedia. No. Uh, <laughs> they, they can go to uh, frogpants.com. There they will find all kinds of podcasts and content. Probably centered in and around some interest they have. And if you like the video game talk earlier on the show and what I bring to it on Wednesdays, we often have game stories on Wednesdays, uh, then you'll probably really like a couple of the shows I have over on the network. So give it a shot. That's frogpants.com. And if you're trying to reach out to me directly, you can find me on Twitter. I'm over there at Scott Johnson. We are over here on this show Monday through Friday at 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We'd love to have you join us live if you can. We'll be back tomorrow. Tom Merritt will be back as well and joined by Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>